Facebook wants to own news, Nintendo wants to be Disney, and there might be a flaw in the cloud. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 337 for Wednesday, May 13th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox, but with IT admin tools that allow you to control and protect your company information. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney, and joining me today to talk about the tech news is Mark Millian, tech editor at Bloomberg Business. Welcome back, Mark. Thank you, Megan. So and let's get right to the to news. Talk to you again. Yeah, great to talk to you. Let's get to the news. Yesterday, we learned that Verizon is buying AOL for $4.4 billion. As I said yesterday, we presume that Verizon is spending the big bucks not for TechCrunch or HuffPost or Engadget, but for AOL's programmatic advertising tool that uses computer algorithms rather than salespeople to buy and sell ads on their websites. Today on Bloomberg News, Bloomberg News, you guys have a profile of AOL CEO Tim Armstrong and what's next for him. Do you think he wants to run Verizon? Uh, I wouldn't doubt if he wants to run Verizon. Um, I don't think he will run Verizon. Um, he talked a lot about his relationship with uh, Marnie Walden through these conversations. She runs Verizon Wireless, um, which is not, I mean, it's a subsidiary of the parent company, which is run by yet another layer of executives. Um, AOL is a big acquisition for Verizon. It's their biggest in, I think, six years um, when they bought, uh, you know, some network infrastructure from um, Frontier in 2009. So it's not an insignificant deal for them. But, you know, Tim is not going to come in there and run the place. Um, he, You know, AOL is going to add a, an important new piece to Verizon with, as you said, some of the uh, the online and digital advertising know-how that they have and turning Verizon into a media company, which is a new thing for them and is kind of a trendy thing to do in the telecom industry with Comcast buying NBC and another a number of other companies getting into entertainment and media. Right. I mean, I've heard a few people talk about, well, does this mean that Engadget and TechCrunch can still, you know, not be biased? But I mean, this is kind of a common thing for everybody to own everybody. It's been going on for a while, right? <laughs> Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, Bloomberg is a technology company. We sell products and, you know, our terminals to uh, to Wall Street and, and businesses around the world. Um, I mentioned Comcast is a is a, you know, communications and media Goliath. Um, and, you know, all, all sorts of media companies have have connections and owners who are associated in all different businesses. But as long as, you know, they're the editorial uh, independence remains. And um, from what I see at AOL, uh, after it bought TechCrunch, it has. And with Engadget, they have maintained edi editorial independence. I don't think that you should be too concerned about that. Right. So now Forbes had an article conjecturing that Verizon made the deal to get Tim Armstrong. Do you agree with that? Mm, no, <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. Um, <laughs> I mean, Tim is, you know, Tim uh, has a has a has a very nice pedigree. He spent uh, a lot of time at Google before running some of their um, sales business, and you know, he's a he's a sharp guy. Uh, but you don't spend four point four billion dollars on one guy. Um, they have, you know, they've created a, a pretty interesting sort of new media business when right now it's hot to be a media business. Um, you don't really think of AOL in the same breath as like Box or BuzzFeed, but they really do have the eyeballs and, you know, a ton of clout in, uh, in digital advertising and in, you know, sort of having the big audience to expose those advertisers to. Right. And, you know, $4.4 .4 billion kind of seems like a lot of money, but it's it's interesting because it's only a fraction of what AOL paid for what AOL paid for Time Warner in 2000. Of course, that was the, you know, dot com bubble, but they paid one hundred and sixty five billion dollars for Time Warner. And that didn't turn out so well for them. Uh, but this so this isn't really that risky of a deal for Verizon, is it? 
No, I mean, I, I mean, AOL is is a shadow of its former self. I mean, yeah. it was, you know, it was really just like a product of a certain era um, in the late '90s. Like they brought the internet to millions of homes, and they were, uh, you know, a lot of people thought, "What is the internet?" And that was AOL at the time. That's no longer the case. They still have their dial-up business, and there still are apparently like a million or two million old people who have no idea what's what this thing is on their bill and they can continue to subscribe. But, um, but yeah, AOL today is a, is a very different company. It's a, it's an, it's a digital media company now. And whereas it was very much a technology and, and telecom company back then, which would have been maybe a more logical match for Verizon, that old AOL than this current one, which makes this deal so interesting. Right. So let's move on to another news story about news or rather about how companies are going to monetize news. Uh, we talked about this before when it was rumored, but now it appears to be a reality. Facebook just announced a program called Instant Articles. It involves a deal with The New York Times and eight other media outlets to post stories directly to the social network's mobile news feeds. How is this going to work exactly? Uh, Facebook is saying that well, Facebook is essentially saying not not in these words, but they're they're saying that news websites suck and they're <laughs> slow and they're bad on phones, and so they're saying just you write the news, you give us your news, and we'll put it together using technology in a way that's not a terrible experience for people when they're using their phones. Um, they're saying that uh, articles that are hosted within Facebook's instant articles service served directly within the app um, can load something like I think eight or ten times faster than if you were to go to the to the newspaper's website um, and so some of some of their partner companies these these eight or nine companies you're talking about will give certain stories to Facebook to kind of organize and arrange within their system so that people who share them on Facebook get get quickly view them on their phones. Right. I mean, they're kind of also saying we have terribly short attention spans, right? Because everybody's had that experience on Facebook on their phone and they're like, oh, that looks like an interesting news story. And then they click and you wait and you're like, eh, I don't care about it anymore, right? <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it is slow to load. I don't think I've ever actually not waited the extra few seconds. So my attention span maybe is I have shorter. More, maybe I have more patience. The thing that bugs me more and what I will close out of a story for, and which I do like that Facebook instant articles would alleviate is, you know, those pop-ups that you get that like, it's impossible to find the close button. Right. It's like up in the corner somewhere and then it gets hidden by another ad that pops up. I will actually leave an article in those instances. And so from that end, I mean, it's Facebook thing is kind of cool, I guess. Right. So what's in it for Facebook? I mean, do they want to own news? Do they just want to keep everybody on Facebook? What, what's in it for them? Yeah. I mean, when when we were hearing about this service um, from sources and reporting it before the announcement, um, my assumption was that they were going to cut some type of deal where they take a bunch of the advertising money, and this is a huge new business play for Facebook. Um, and I think a lot of people within media were suspicious of that. And so it turned out to be pretty surprising that the deals are actually very much in favor of the media companies. The the companies that participate, at least in this early stage, get to keep the revenue from the ads and they can place their own ads and kind of offer a, a very similar experience to what they offer within their own news websites. Um, and so what's in it for Facebook? I guess they're kind of following the same mantra that they have with a lot of their new products with Oculus and, and others and WhatsApp and Instagram is that they don't try to monetize a new thing right away. They just want to kind of get it out there and let people experience it. And once, once people find that it's a much better experience to share news within Facebook, then maybe they'll start going to Facebook for their news instead of going to Twitter. Interesting. So we had another Facebook story that you guys wrote about today that um, about Goodwill over there. Uh, they announced new benefits for contract workers. Uh, what did they announce today? Yeah, so the, uh, Facebook is um, created new standards for uh, people who are contract workers, essentially not full-time employees. And this would include like the bus drivers and people in the cafeterias and ground maintenance. Um, 
where they get at least 15 paid days off for holidays, sick time, vacation, and a new minimum wage that starts at $15 an hour. Um, and that's that's pretty good. I mean, that's like more than double the national average. Um, California's about to raise its minimum wage to $10 in January. Uh, and so, you know, this is this is a good thing that it's like, rather than having such a stark two class system within these companies where these engineers are making like two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year and interacting with these people who are making, you know, 10 bucks an hour, um, making their food, driving them to work. It's, uh, it, it kind of doesn't exactly level it, but it, at least it's, it shows some love to the people who are, you know, keeping the wheels going on, on, at the headquarters. So this is only at the headquarters for now. Um, it's only in the United States. So I, I think it applies to, um, to, to the company within the United States. So some of the satellite offices in uh, New York and elsewhere. Okay. So now Facebook isn't the only company that's offering benefits like this, right? Apple has, and Microsoft, uh, is there something behind this new trend? Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, Apple has, uh, you know, an, a number of tech companies um, have had unions pop up um, around their sort of contract workers, especially the uh, the bus drivers. Um, and Apple uh, said in March that they were giving 25% raises to their drivers. Um, Microsoft also said in March that they're going to be giving contract workers um, at least 15 paid days off, vacation days. Um, and so some other companies uh, within tech are making similar sorts of outreaches to their contract workers, trying to make life a little better for, um, for, for that level of their workforce. Uh, but Facebook, you know, kind of came out here. They weren't really under pressure. And they said, our, you know, we want to give our, our folks in California um, a more reasonable work life. All right. Well, that was very nice of them. So we have some more news. You're going to stick around, right, Mark? Yes. You're not going anywhere. Great. So coming up, we're going to Happy talk to. about Windows 10, Nintendo theme parks and more. But first, many of you use Dropbox. We do too. And at Twit, we use it to sync and share files, videos, photos, program schedules, and probably a lot of other secret stuff that nobody tells me about. Over 4 million businesses throughout the world use Dropbox. Dropbox for Business is a better way to manage accounts, manage billing, have visibility and control over your data. Dropbox for Business lets you do just that, and you don't have to waste time finding a different solution. So what is Dropbox for Business? It's the same easy Dropbox experience your employees already love and trust, which means less training and more productivity. Simple storage and sharing for any type of file on any platform and any device. Dropbox for Business never runs out of space. Each user starts off with a terabyte, and it's very easy to expand that. Staff can collaborate with team members and securely invite and control access to outside partners, clients, and vendors. And most importantly for IT professionals, you get control. Dropbox for Business has powerful admin controls like remote wipe, intuitive sharing, and permission controls plus complete audit logs. This way, IT can make sure only the right people get access to sensitive company data. Dropbox for Business integrates with third-party security solutions and gives you lots of control. And last but not least, the robust Dropbox for Business infrastructure uses encryption for file data in transit and at rest, plus seg segmentation and hashing to anonymize files. Extra security features are available like single sign-on and two-step verification. If you want to give it a try, take advantage of the fact that your employees already use Dropbox and sign up for Dropbox for Business. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for Business. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Microsoft announced the different editions of Windows, including Home, Mobile, Pro, Enterprise, and more but they still did not announce a release date. Mark, we talked about this before. I know you said you were still on Windows 7. Will you upgrade to Windows 10 when it comes out? Um, I would consider it if I had the option to do so. I mean, my, my Windows usage extends as far as my desk at the office. And so I get new versions of software when my IT department tells me it's safe to. <laughs> Uh, so I'm stuck on Windows 7 still, but um, Windows 7 or Windows 10 sounds nice. I love me some Windows. <laughs> I want 
I want the best edition that there is. <laughs> well, need that enterprise. Yes, and there's Internet of Things. There's all kinds of Cortana. I don't know. I know you're a Mac person mostly. So um, have you tried Cortana at all? Have you used her? On- uh, I played it with a little bit on the um, on Windows Phone. And I think it's nice. I don't. I don't think it's as good as the Google one. Um, and I. I'm tempted to switch to an Android just for the voice features. I find Siri to be pretty bad, although it's improving. Yes. Well, you know, you can get Google now and use the voice features on your iPhone. Also, that's what yeah, I. Yeah, but it doesn't do. It doesn't do everything no. that that the Android one does. Like mm-hmm. the Android one hooks into all different apps, and that's you true. can have it launch apps and like actually like do things within the apps which i think is cool we can't have everything yet right no (laughs) you guys also wrote a story about nintendo's new strategy and how it's starting to look a lot like disney's last week we heard that nintendo will start making mobile games they'll open a new theme park there could be movie deals uh what else do these two companies have in common uh a lot i mean the the theme park stuff wasn't enough for you (laughs) there's it's uh it's insane how like you know, Nintendo was was a very close company for a long time and very resistant to, um, in a lot of ways, to to marketing its brand outside of the game sphere. I mean, they they went through a period in like the '80s and the '90s where they were doing cartoons and Happy Meals, and they were like, you know, on, seemingly on the path to becoming an entertainment company. Uh, and then in the 2000s and, and this decade, they kind of retrenched a little bit and, you know, investors are kind of looking for what's next and, you know, game sales are not at least in consoles killing it for Nintendo anymore. And so now it seems like they're going back to their old ways and like advancing in many ways, um, like their deal with, uh, with DNA in Japan to create smartphone games, an, an area that Disney has actually invested a ton of money in with, with some of their acquisitions around um, smartphone gaming. Um, and, you know, there was the rumor uh, a little while back, the Wall Street Journal story reporting that um, Netflix was looking into doing a Legend of Zelda, like, um, you know, TV mm-hmm. series which would be awesome if Nintendo is listening. Please make that. So Nintendo was a part of your childhood is what you're saying. You're admitting. Oh, yeah. It's a part of my adulthood. <laughs> I, I love Nintendo. I still have my original Wii because, like, all the games I downloaded through Virtual Console, you can play, like, Donkey Kong and Nintendo, and then they've got the Sega games on there. I, I still boot that up from time to time. Yeah, see, it's a generation thing. Like, I was Atari all the way. Then I skipped right to Tetris and laptops, and Nintendo just wasn't part of... I can see why people are excited. I uh, looked, missed out. I again. did. I did miss out. <laughs> So ZDNet is reporting that there's a zero-day security flaw that's bigger than Heartbleed. It's called Venom, which stands for Virtualized Environment Neglected Operations Manipulation, which is, really seems like they just really wanted to call it Venom. CrowdStrike, the company who discovered the vulnerability, says it could expose sensitive and personally identifiable information, potentially impacting thousands of organizations and millions of end users that rely on affected VMs for shared computing resources, connectivity, storage, security, and privacy. Uh, Is is this scary because it sort of shatters the myth of cloud security? Yeah, and I mean, it definitely sounds really scary. I think it's going to, I don't think it's going to have the same impact that Heartbleed had from a, from like a regular people perspective. Because, I mean, the the idea of, like, data centers and the cloud and all that is, like, pretty opaque to most people. They don't really understand what's happening. They're just going on the Internet and all of their stuff is on their different devices. Um, and I think, like, with Heartbleed, that was, like, an, a, a problem within, like, the websites and the, the HTML of the websites and how they were programmed. And it was, like, you could go to a website and if they didn't update... Their software is like, why didn't, why aren't you protecting all of us? Like, I'm going to your site and now I'm exposed and possibly gonna get harm done to my machines. For data centers, it's a little like if Amazon doesn't protect their data centers, like everybody's screwed. So in that way, it could have a bigger impact, but it's just harder for people to understand. I think. I really hope that all of the the few major cloud companies that there are out there, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Rackspace, 
they should all fix this. And then I think that would like save most of the internet. Right. So and they, then it's the little hosting centers that really have to worry. Right. So they just need to update their VM and, you know, as opposed to Heartbleed, which, revol you know, as you're saying, it required a lot of input. It, we had to all change our passwords and everything. So this is more, um, this is easier to fix, although it's potentially scarier. Um, for sure. I mean, but, you know, Heartbleed was fixable and still, you know, we did a story, I think like last month or the month before was the one year anniversary of Heartbleed. And like most websites still haven't addressed it. Right. Like I think you and I talked about this actually last time you came on. Yeah, that's but, right. Yeah. Yeah. Major websites still like have not updated their software to, to protect from Heartbleed a year later, which right. is crazy. So even if it can be fixed, whether it gets fixed by everybody is unlikely. Right. Well, finally, your colleague Spencer Soper, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. He has an interesting you piece. You are. Oh, good. He has a piece about how March Madness is coming to China with the help of Alibaba. And it won't actually be March. It'll be November. What's the story here? Uh, yeah, so uh, Alibaba, the Amazon of China, giant e-commerce company, is uh, is working with some some leagues in the NCAA uh, to hold regular season college men's basketball games in China. So the first one in Shenzhen in November, um, in sorry, I think it's in Shanghai in November. Uh, um, they're expecting as many as eighteen thousand people. Alibaba is going to exclusively live stream the event throughout the country. Um, and this is like a first to have a regular season game that counts against both teams' records taking place in China, um, which kind of could suck for the players who have to or are going to potentially be severely jet lagged by the time they start this game. Um, but it's cool; like they're appealing to a massive market, and a, a lot of sports are um, are doing that. Like the NBA is, holds preseason games in China; like they see huge potential in appealing to like the you know most populous country on the planet right there's a lot of fans there <laughs> a lot of potential fans yeah. not a lot of them are watching soccer and other stuff but there's potential to try and like they're interested in basketball as as are the japanese and a lot of other asian countries so um it could be a big deal yeah and impressive that alibaba negotiated this as well yeah, I think they spent something like six months working with the NCAA to to try to get this deal done. Um, and so they, uh, you know, Alibaba is so dominant in China and they are one of the few companies there that really has the reach and the clout to kind of bring something like this to the masses. All right. Well, Mark, thank you again for coming on. Mark Millian is a tech editor at Bloomberg Business. Thank you so much for joining us. You can find out more about Mark on Twitter. Um, Any place else where they can see your work? Uh, Bloomberg.com slash tech. All right. Got lots of good stuff there. Thank you so much, Mark. All right. Thanks, Megan. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. If you're a fan of this show, go post a review on iTunes or YouTube or a bathroom wall or wherever anyone will let you post a review. And send us your selfies watching the show. Today's TN2 selfie of the day is Wayne Wallace of Las Vegas, Nevada. He sent us this photo with the caption, watching TN2 in the kitchen cooking dinner. Thank you for sending the photo, Wayne. And I hope you made enough for all of us. If you want to be on the show, tag your pictures with hashtag TN2Selfie on Twitter, Google+, Instagram, or via email to TN2 at twit.tv and tell us a little bit about yourself. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2, write to us at TN2 at twit.tv, and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. Don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific. I am Megan Maroney. Thank you for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.